In this video, we'll take a closer look at the link between obesity and type 2 diabetes. Risk factors for type 2 diabetes can be grouped into two categories. Non-modifiable factors, which include age, genetics, and ethnicity, and modifiable factors, such as obesity, a lack of physical activity, and unhealthy eating. Because obesity is cited as the most important risk factor in developing type 2 diabetes, we'll be focusing on how obesity can lead to the development of this disease. Research shows that obesity can lead to insulin resistance, which can then lead to type 2 diabetes. Let's take a closer look at how this works. When the calories you consume are greater than the calories you use for energy, the excess calories are stored as fat, also known as adipose tissue. Adipose tissue can be burned for energy, but it also releases fatty acids, hormones, and pro-inflammatory cytokines as part of its normal function. As adipose tissue accumulates, the release of fatty acids, hormones, and pro-inflammatory cytokines also increases. Research shows that the increased release of pro-inflammatory cytokines can lead to the development of insulin resistance. So what exactly are pro-inflammatory cytokines? It helps to break the term down. Cytokines are small molecules that act as signals in cellular pathways. Pro-inflammatory essentially means inflammation causing. Pro-inflammatory cytokines are released in response to infection, disease, or trauma and cause inflammation. We usually associate inflammation with physical trauma such as an accidental injury. This type of inflammation is usually considered acute or short term. On the other hand, pro-inflammatory cytokines that are released by adipose tissue lead to chronic low-grade inflammation. Chronic low-grade inflammation means that the inflammation is much less severe than your bumped head, but rather than going away in a few hours, it remains for long periods of time. Let's do a quick review of what we've learned so far. Excess caloric intake leads to the accumulation of adipose tissue in your body. As the amount of adipose tissue increases, so does the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Pro-inflammatory cytokines lead to the development of chronic low-grade inflammation. But how exactly does inflammation lead to insulin resistance? Let's try thinking about it like this. Your doorbell is pretty old and beginning to get worn out so it doesn't always ring. You find that pressing harder makes it work sometimes so you don't bother to fix it. Even though the doorbell is getting more and more worn out, you can usually fix this by pressing a little bit harder. A few months later, you realize that no matter how hard you press, your doorbell just won't ring. You realize that the doorbell is completely broken and you have no choice but to fix it. So how does this analogy relate to inflammation, insulin resistance, and diabetes? Over time, chronic low-grade inflammation interferes with normal insulin signaling pathways. This is similar to the doorbell getting worn out. The amount of insulin your pancreas normally produces becomes insufficient for adequate glucose uptake. When this happens, the pancreas will usually respond by producing more insulin so that the glucose uptake isn't affected. This is like pressing a little bit harder to make your doorbell work. In some individuals, the pancreas stops being able to produce enough insulin to overcome the blocked pathways, effectively leading to insulin resistance. In an insulin resistant state, your body is unable to produce enough insulin to overcome the blocked signaling pathways. This means that insulin-dependent glucose transport can't occur, and cells are unable to receive glucose. The glucose that can't be transported into cells remains in the bloodstream and results in high blood glucose levels. High blood glucose levels as a result of insulin resistance is what characterizes type 2 diabetes. So what can you do to prevent the progression of type 2 diabetes? 
Type 2 diabetes is unique because it is a disease that you can help treat. Losing 10% of your body weight, increasing physical activity, and avoiding fluctuating blood sugar levels are steps that you can take to prevent the progression of this disease. Thanks for watching and be sure to check out our other video for more information on why it's important to control blood glucose levels.